He's only three explaining this to me. And he said, so before I was born, I was talking to God and he told me I had to come down and be a human. And I said, well, what did you say to that? I told him I didn't want to come. Why not? Well, because it's so nice over there, Mom, and it's not so nice over here. Did you tell God that? And he said, yeah, I did. And I said, well, what did God say? Hello, everyone. I am here today with Margo McKinnon. Thank you so much for joining me. Melissa, it's a pleasure. Likewise. So let's start at the beginning. In listening to your other interviews that you've done, I'm picking up on the fact that you've always been a very spiritually open person and you've had spiritual experiences and a spiritual connection from the time you were a child. So I would love to learn a little bit more about your childhood and how and when those experiences began. That's a great question to start off with. And yes, it is true. And with some of your viewers here, they had spiritual experiences as a small child. And I would say the first big one that shaped my life, I was four years old and I had a little doll named Michael. And I used to go and put him in his little crib and pull his blanket up. Like I was a mother from the time I was born, I swear, because I loved all my dolls. And um, I was putting him to bed and it was in my living room. I had a little crib and, and it was in complete darkness. My family was in the basement watching television. And as I was pulling up the blanket, I heard, you are to be a teacher. And I said, my little four-year-old self said, okay. And to me at the time, that meant like a school teacher. And I became a school teacher for 25 years and I taught English literature in high school. And I loved teaching that because great literature is about the human experience. And there was a lot of spiritual depth to the literature and during literature because it's these great questions we ask ourselves. Where did we come from? What's real? What's not real? What is the imagination? All of those kinds of things we get to look at in different points of view from the great writers. And I swear they had some spiritual muse that was speaking to them. And then they wrote a story about it. That was the first one that I always pointed to as my first experience. But then I realized I had one when I was a little kid and about three years old. And we used to live in Cocoa Beach, Florida. And I was on my surfboard. Now, some people hear me and they think I'm on some big wave. No, I'm a little three-year-old on probably a wave about this thing, but massive to me. Right? So I'm on my surfboard and I tumble off the surfboard and I fall under the water and uh, I'm trying to get up, but the waves are pushing me down the riptide or something, whatever that's called, is pulling me out. So I'm kind of going this way and I can feel myself getting dragged out. But I can still see the beach. It's not that far, but I'm three. I can't really do anything. And I could see my parents, but I couldn't call out to them because every time I did, another wave crashed me down. And I, so I was in a moment of panic. And then I heard with the, that same voice, with the next wave, let the wave push you down, dig your toes into the sand and push towards shore and let the wave pull you on. And I did that and then I survived. But it, the thing is, I use that now as a metaphor. When you're struggling, just let that experience, it'll push you onto shore. It's a learning. And so now I know that voice is always there. Whenever I need it, I can just draw on that voice. But I was also a little kid who saw spirits that they, they came at night mainly. I had very good parents. And some of my readers tell me that they wish they'd had parents like that who would listen to their spiritual experience. And some of them were told that that's the devil talking, that's your imagination, or you're trying to get attention. I had very good parents who, to me, who really legitimized my experiences, normalized them. This was my normal way of being in the world, to see spirits at night, to have visions into the future, to be able to take my spirit out and go places. So I had a really great upbringing that way. 
And what we find from the research now is that children who have parents who diminish their experience or say that's the devil or whatever, they end up in a lifelong search to find out what was that experience. Or they have a sense of what is reality? Because that experience was very real to me. And yet you're telling me that it's not real. And to, and to cap this off, I'd say I had a student in my class. He was grade 12, football jacket, hardly ever spoke in class. And we were doing Hamlet. And Hamlet sees the ghost of his father at the top of the castle. That's how the Shakespeare starts the story. And so the kids all want to share the ghost stories and everything. So we were doing that for a whole hour. They just love it. And a lot of kids have stories to tell. And this very quiet football player, he finally said, once you've had an encounter with a spiritual dimension, you're a changed person and there's no going back. And the room was silent. And I'd have to say that's true. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Yes, 100% agree with that. I remember you talking in another interview about how as a little child, you were communicating. I don't remember if it was with a voice or with a spirit or who it was, but you were telling them, like you're breathing in and out. And you said, how long do I have to keep doing this? And I can so relate to that because I have had the same thought because, I mean, I, it's not everybody that I can say this to. I'm not at all wanting to leave here. I love my life. I'm so happy here. But there's such a peace in that stillness between the breath. It's, it's hard to describe, but I think that you may understand. I knew from the time I was a little girl that I lived mainly in a spiritual dimension. And I'd have to take time out every day to just go and lie down. I need that today. I just need to go and lie down now. I need a break from being a human being. And so as a child, my mom was very good about it because I had a little sister who just loved me so much and just wanted to play with me 24-7. And, I, and my mom would have to say, now, Anne, Margo needs to go and lie down for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So she was really good about that. And I would go into my room and then I would talk to this voice that told me I had to be a teacher. And I would say, well, how long do I have to do this? Like, how long do I have to stay here? What do you want me to do? And being a teacher was a long way off. I was only like five or six at this time. How long do I have to do it? But I had, Melissa, I actually did have an over, overwhelming sense that I wanted to go home. Mm -hmm. I felt living here was quite exhausting. And because, and when we get to it, talking about this model that the spirits told me about, that voice gave it to me. People who are spirit, what I describe as spirit dominant, they're more spirit than they are human. Mm -hmm. Life is exhausting and they have to cart around. I'm five, ten and a half. I have to cart around this big body. I have to breathe. I have to eat. I have to deal with human mm -hmm. struggles all day. And sometimes I would say as a little kid, I just want to go home. And in one of my interviews, I and it kind of caused a bit of a stir, but I got so many emails from people saying I had the same thing. So I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, and as I said, I had a lovely family. It was, it was magnificent. It couldn't have been better for me. It's what I needed. And and I know some people say you chose your parents and you chose all your life experiences. I'm not quite sure if that's entirely true for everybody. I feel that whoever this voice was, and I'm going to say, I, I kind of think it was God saying, Margo, you have to be a teacher. Uh, this is what you have to do. And I have to say that uh, my whole life has been listening to that voice. I do whatever it tells me to do. And they get keep getting bigger and bigger, the things that I have to do. But as a little kid, I remember coming up out of the basement, probably just tuck my little doll in again or something. Mm -hmm. And I took out the butcher knife and I took my little shirt up and I had it there. And that voice said, put that back, put that back. And I put it back and I said, but I just want to go home. 
I, like I was lonesome. I was lonesome mm-hmm. for what was over on the other side. It's like having to go to summer camp and you miss your parents. Right. And so I just had a homesickness and I just wanted to go home now. Now I think that the reason why I was given my purpose so early in my life was to keep me here. Because it was always put that back. You are to be a teacher. Okay. And I stayed so committed to that. I could have done a whole bunch of things. I was pretty good at business and everything. And could you go do this? And I thought I can. I promised God that I would be a teacher. And so I will be a teacher. So some of the listeners will will write to me and tell me they had the same thing. And I would say, stay here. Stay here because there's a grander purpose waiting for you to step into. You're going to miss the point of your life if you do it. And I don't have those feelings anymore, like ever. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. This is something I've wondered about as a parent now, because as I was telling you before we began recording, that I was raised with definitely a fear of hell ingrained into me. Like there's no way you can know for sure you could have Uh, messed up and forgotten to confess a sin and God's going to send you to hell. So there's this huge fear of death that's instilled into you. And now as a parent, I wonder, because obviously I'm not raising my kids in that same way, and I'm very into near-death experiences and exploring the beauty of what's on the other side. And so I wonder as a parent, hmm, how could that affect my children? Like, how can I have a balance there with that? You know what I mean? Because my children aren't, don't have that same fear of death, which I wouldn't want them to have. But what if I went too far in the opposite direction? The thing is, when your children have spiritual experience, and they come in so many different forms, Mm -hmm. is a spiritual practice, that what you want to do as a parent is just kind of watch them, learn from them, ask them questions. I'll give you an example. Uh, When I did my PhD in Oxford, I interviewed some professors of religious education and how it was uh, put into schools in the UK. And uh, there was one of my interviewees and uh, he said, here's an example of a perfect spiritual experience. I was in a museum and I saw this mother standing in front of a painting and her little child who was about six or seven was sitting on the bench in front of the painting and the mother explained every detail about the painting the perspective the use of color the shapes and explained absolutely everything to that child and in that moment i thought what a beautiful spiritual experience and i said Oh, I had a similar experience only with my son, only I took a completely opposite point approach. I said, my son had fallen in love with Buddha. I don't know how, but he was like sitting in Buddha poses. He was all over practicing what he thought was Buddhism. So I I had him in a museum and I have two other kids. He was my youngest one. He would have been about six or seven. And he was sitting in front of a Buddha statue in exactly the shape of the Buddha. And my other two said, oh, should we go and get Alex? I can tell him that we're going on to the next section. I said, no, let's just wait for him to have his own experience. And then he caught up to us and because we kept in eyesight of him. And then I said, well, how was your experience with Buddha? And he said, well, mom, to understand something, you must become that thing. Wow. So I see the two parents, and the, one could be religion, where the parent explains everything, how everything is, according to a doctrine and principles and practice. Or you can ask your child, what was your experience? I would have missed that whole thing of to understand something, you must become that thing. So when I talk to people, because I do private sessions with people, and And they'll say, well, I came from a horrible, quite abusive background. To understand something, you must become that pain. You had to become the pain to understand pain. Now that you understand pain, we can move you forward because it creates the richness of life. And so 
I think with your own children, just ask them some questions. Listen, what was your experience? Tell me about that. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I love what your son said about if you understand to understand something, you must become that thing. I think that's the basis of empathy. Exactly. Let's move on to your near-death experiences. So how old were you when your first one happened? I was 18 when the first one happened and about 37 when the second one happened. So the first one, I was 18, really, really sick. The, I was in a dormitory. I was at university and they put me in this infirmary, which was in the basement of our dormitory. And I had a nurse that was supposed to be looking after me and I was like burning up with fever. I couldn't move like they, they were waiting till I stabilized so that they could transport me home. And the nurse said to me, Oh, she must have been a student nurse that I, at the time, right? And I, she said to me, Oh, I've been really wanting to go out with this guy for such a long time. And he finally asked me out for tonight, but I can't, I had told him I couldn't go because, well, I have to look after you. And so I'm in my bed like this. And I said, Oh, just go on your date. I'll be fine. She said, Really? I'll call you at nine o'clock. Okay. Cause I had a phone by my bed. So off she goes. I have an experience where. I come out of my body. Some people say, Margo, that was an out-of-body experience. Only because I wasn't hooked up to a monitor and you can see I was clinically right. dead, right? I, I wasn't there. But anyway, so I came out and I was, I was going towards the most beautiful orange light. And then I thought, oh, I've got to say goodbye to my roommate. And so I came up out of the basement. I was on the ceiling and I was coming up out of up the stair stairwell. And then I saw at the front of the hallway in the lobby, all these girls in their ball gowns. And I was still on the ceiling and I was looking at them and I thought, oh, I guess they're going to a big ball tonight. And I, this one girl looked at me and I did a somersault in the air and I said, you've just seen your first ghost. And then I went up the stairwell like this and I went in the room. And, and so I, and my roommate wasn't there and my roommate actually, and I are still friends all these years. She called me this morning. So it was like, we're still friends all these years later. And I went in, she wasn't there. And so I thought, I've got to go. And I just went, and then I came back into my body and then the nurse came running and she said, I called you and called you and called you. Like I said, at nine o'clock, I thought you were dead. I've rushed back. And, um, I said, I think I was dead. Like, were the girls going somewhere? Yeah, they were going to the military ball tonight because we had a military college across the way. And they were going there. And they, were they waiting for taxis? Yes, they were all getting picked up. On I said, I saw them. And she said, you couldn't have seen them because you're so sick, you can't even get out of bed. That story didn't profoundly impact my life because I really, with your viewers, think about if you can document all your experiences, see what the lesson that you were supposed to learn for each one so that you can move to the next big lesson. That one didn't profoundly impact my life, but it profoundly impacted one of my students. Really? Yes, because I think she'd be okay. I won't mention her name, but her best friend was murdered. Okay. And so she was in a hotel room it, with a bunch of girls because they were at a basketball tournament. And her phone went off in the night. And when she tried to scramble for it out of her purse, she got there and it went. It was over. She didn't get there in time. And it had no caller ID on it. And so she didn't think much of it until the next morning when her mom called to say, your best friend was murdered. Oh, no. And she said she was so racked with guilt. She thought if I'd gotten to the phone, I could have saved her life. And she was in my class and I didn't know that story, but I could see the light in her eyes was gone. And she just couldn't, she wasn't, she was failing and she should be like exceptional, have a really great writing mark. And one day I looked at her and I said, could you come in for lunch today? And she said, okay, what for? And I said, well, I see you. I see you. You're not doing well right now. And 
come, if I can help you, I will. And if I can't help you, I'll find somebody who can. Mm -hmm. So she came in for lunch and she told me the story. And I said, you know what? I had a very similar experience. Only I was the spirit. And the first person I wanted to say goodbye to was my best friend. She wasn't home and I had to go off. So that there was no caller ID on your phone. It means it was her. She just wanted to say goodbye. Feel honored by that. So do you see how that story, it didn't impact my life. I had coffee with her, this girl, she's now in her 30s, and she was going off to do her PhD, and she wanted to have a coffee for me with me before she left. And she said, I, she said, you changed my whole life. You said, no, she didn't say that. She said, you saved my life. Wow. And I said, well, how did I do that? And she said, you looked at me. It makes me cry a little bit, Melissa, because I get really emotional about my students because I love them so much. She said, you looked at me one day and said, I see you. And she said, what you didn't know in that moment was I had everything prepared to kill myself. She said, I was so racked with guilt that I wanted to kill myself. And I was ready to do it. And to join my friend, because I didn't deserve to be here. And you flip that all around. So you see, I'm a teacher, but I teach about the spiritual side of life. So that story, my near death there when I was 18, because she was 18. It wasn't so much it changed my life, but it was stored in my life experience so that I could share it with her and save hers. Oh, amazing. That's just incredible to think that you were given that experience for her and that it was so life-changing for her. Yes. And earlier you said that, that I always grew up like this. And I was actually on a podcast and someone said, when did you come out of the closet? And I said, I was never in the closet. Yeah. This is my way of being. I know nothing different. I understand that all these spiritual experiences I get one after the other, after the other. Maybe they're not necessarily for me, but they're for somebody else. Mm. To understand something, I must become that thing. So to understand for my student what was happening to her, I had to become that myself so I could share that with her. But my second one, my mom had passed and I was doing actually an Indigenous ceremony and it was a fasting ceremony. So some listeners will say, oh, I was on, I don't even know, because I don't, <laughs> I, was, I don't do any like drugs or any of these things. And I don't take any hallucinogens. I really like the very pure, pure spiritual experience. But I was doing a fasting ceremony. It was a four day ceremony. And we don't like to go into it a lot because I don't want any of my indigenous friends to think that I'm appropriating any of their culture or anything. Right. But I was invited into the ceremony and I was doing the ceremony. And it's a fasting for a day where you have to, it's quite rigorous, where you have to transcend the body because of the fasting. Then you have to transcend the mind, which tells you to quit. That helps you get into the spiritual dimension. Well, anyway, day three, I'm doing the ceremony. And you have to be in the hot sun, like all day. So I... I keeled over and I just went like this. Oh. oh my God. Good. And then my spirit came out and it went to the most absolute unconditional love ever. Like I, it was so beautiful. And it was this white space. Like it was pure white, unconditional love. I could see other spirits. They look like gray kind of going up too. And I could see them also going up. But I was greeted by my mom and she came down and was just sort of her shoulders and head. And she came down. My mom had this smile like this and she was just smiling at me. And uh, I said, oh, mom, I'm here. And I was with my mom when she passed. And um, so she came down and she said, you can't come up any farther. You can't come up any farther. You have to go back down. You're a teacher. You're a mom. But it's always teacher first. Teacher comes first. For me, it's the one thing that will suck me back into my body and keep going. Um, so I came back and then I went, I came back into my body and I just went, God. Yeah. And then I looked around. They don't help you in the ceremony. If you die, you die. That's oh. the whole. 
right? Like, well, that was you're supposed to be your experience was to die, right? They'll just keep going. So anyway, I came back into my body. I had my friend over here. She was a little bit concerned, but everybody else was still doing the ceremony. Well, <laughs> so anyway, I came back in and I looked around and I, I had to kind of reacquaint that these are my hands. I have a body. Okay. And my body felt extra heavy. I had to get back up. All right. Keep going. Okay. I get it. I'm Margo McKinnon, high school English teacher. Get it. But what I realized out of, because I like learn from every experience. This one was for me. And I think everybody else too. What I learned, I experienced, I became absolute unconditional love. And that's why I love the title of your podcast, Melissa. Oh, thank you. I love it because I became absolute unconditional love. When I was going up there, I breathed it in till it went right through my body, right down to the tips of my toes. I was one with unconditional love. And when I came back here, I thought, oh, now I'm back into the body and back into having to be human and back like I was a little kid. How long do I have to be here? But what I decided to do was I said, you know what? I am going to create an environment of unconditional love wherever I go. In, the cl in my classroom, this will be a sacred space for all the kids to feel that unconditional love. Why does it have to be over there? Why, why does it have to be? Why can't it be right here? So if you say, okay, I'm going to create my classroom. I'm going to have my family, my children in unconditional love. I'm going to be an unconditional love. And I'm going to protect that for myself. It really, really helped me to understand that. And it also helped me because my son, he was three at the time. So this is before his, to become his Buddha phase. But one time he was three years old and I was putting him to bed. And he said to me, you know, mom, before I was born, I was talking to God. And of course, I want to know, what does God look like? Is it God male, female? What is God? And he said, God, it looks white. It's white, but you know it's God. And I said, but you're saying he. Yeah, but it's just white. I'm just saying he. He's only three explaining this to me. And he said, so before I was born, I was talking to God and he told me I had to come down and be a human. And I said, well, what did you say to that? I told him I didn't want to come. Well, I know it. Well, because it's so nice over there, Mom, and it's not so nice over here. And so I told, did you tell God that? And he said, yeah, I did. And I said, well, what did God say? Well, he told me I had to come down and be a human. So I asked if I could see my mother. And he showed me a picture of you, like a photograph. And I looked at it and I said, oh, she looks mean. And I don't want to come down and be her son. I'm after the experience, not what I think about it, right? Oh, well, I said, okay, yes. And then what did he say to that? He said, that's who your mother's going to be, and you're to come down and be a human. He said, so when God tells you to do something, mom, you do it. And I got inside your body. And then when I was born, I looked at your face. I thought, oh, you're, you're beautiful. <laughs> and I'm glad you're my mom. The, the, the interesting thing for me of that story is that he was born feet first and he was being hung all the way down by his own cord. So he was actually born dead. He was like total, the color of my shirt, not breathing hard, it stopped. And I think that experience that he had, the talking to God was in that moment. And he said, okay, I'll get inside. And then he was born. Oh. Amazing. So, so I think that experience, but it talks to us, Melissa, about why does it have to be mean down here? Mm -hmm. Why, why do people make it difficult? Why are there toxic people down here? Why can't we live in a beautiful space of unconditional love and kindness? Mm -hmm. Why does it have to be over there? Why do we have some little baby saying, oh, I don't want to go to there? Why would I want to go here? Right. And mm -hmm. I think that that leads um, into the next topic that I wanted to ask you about, which is your 
Let me make sure I get this right. The body, mind, spirit, soul, oneness, dominance theory. And the reason that what you just said leads into that is because based on my understanding of it, the questions that you're asking there are the perspective of somebody who's spirit dominant, that we're thinking things like, why can't we just have peace on earth? And why can't we just all love each other? And we tend to come up against um, other perspectives when we come here in this world. I know for myself, I got a lot of, well, this is just the way it is. That's not realistic. And so I, w- I would love to hear more about these five different, I think there's five different dimensions, dimensions, dimensions to ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the positives maybe of each of them. So we, I can better understand maybe the way other people look at things and. Yes. So I was doing my master's degree because my school jurisdiction wanted me to become a principal of a school. And so I had to get my master's degree. So I did it in education. And I was actually doing this very mastery kind of topic, like teacher professional learning and organizational culture. Doesn't that sound like a master's thesis? So anyway, I was doing that and I was taking all this change leadership course and I had to write a thesis and everything. We had to take 10 courses. And the 10th course, I thought, I've done all the mandatory ones. I'm going to take one course that's just for myself, my own fascination. I am interested in teacher professional learning, but I'm more interested in the spiritual side because that's my purpose in life. And so our first, I took this course called Philosophy of Mind. The very first, because I've never been in the closet. We all had to say why we were taking this course. And of course, well, mine is because I have so many spiritual experiences and I do this and this, and I'm fascinated by this topic. And what had ended up happening over the course of this, this course we were taking was that people started revealing their own spiritual stories. So you just need that one person sitting there saying, yeah, it happens to me. Anyway, our first homework assignment was, how are the body, mind, spirit related? I went home because I have that voice that talks to me and answers all my questions. I'm telling you, this voice is the best person for the knowledge I get. My therapist, my best friend, my consult, everything, right? My big support, my bodyguard, everything. So I asked that voice. And it was really the first time I ever actually saw it. Because I used to just hear it, you are to be a teacher. But when I sat sat on my couch and I had my yellow pad of paper, which I like to write my notes on, was sitting on there and I said, so how are the body, mind, spirit related? For the first time, Melissa, I actually saw it in my living room. It was huge figure in my living room, huge. And I looked, okay. And it started to tell me what the relationship and it said, you actually have five dimensions not just three and now i'm gonna i'm gonna do it in the order that makes sense and then i'll go back and say how it actually revealed it to me okay so what it said is we have five dimensions of self we have a body a mind a spirit a soul i put one on here but when i talk about it i say oneness Mm -hmm. so you have five dimensions of self you're born dominant in one of them gifted, talented. That's your orientation to the world. And you grow the other ones over time. A body dominant person loves hair, makeup, nails, fashion, design, shopping. And I love body dominant people because they taught me so much about how to organize my the physical part of life because I really what, didn't have a lot. And to be honest, Melissa, I used to think it was a waste of time. Yeah. But now I realize, hey, it's really pleasurable. That's partly why I wanted to go home was because I wasn't thoroughly enjoying the physical material world. And I could. Mind dominant. They're really good at systematizing, organizing, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets, logic, rational thinking. And we need these people to have the inventions for medicine, to build a bridge across the river do all these kinds of engineering things to keep us safe. Spirit dominant. If you believe you came from absolute unconditional love, this place that I went to in my near death, this place that my son said, it's so nice over there. 
it's not so nice over here, Mom. Right. If then spirit dominant people, they feel a little homesick back here because they, they're more of the spirit and they value unconditional love and peacefulness. And they, when their spirit is inside looking out their eyes, they see a world that is unnecessarily harsh and abrasive. Mm-hmm. So they sometimes want to go home. But I would say just start working on your other dimensions and you can, you can make your mark. And I'm also saying, Melissa, we need more spirit dominant leaders, people who know what unconditional love, patience, kindness, that there's more to life than the logical and the physical. Mm-hmm. But these people are staying kind of hidden because they don't want to step into the world where it's harsh and abrasive. Exactly. They kind of stay, stay here. And so I'm really encouraging spirit dominant people to get the skill set because we need a change. Soul. Soul is your purpose. So I was given my purpose very early in my life at four years old. It keeps me here. It's my anchor. If I didn't know my purpose in life, I would have been gone a long time ago. So I really think that God, universe, creator gave me my purpose early. And other people will grow into theirs. So if you don't know what yours are, and I get a lot of people who are retiring from a mind-dominant job, and they said, well, I'm ready for my soul purpose. Excellent. It's opening up for you. This is what your retirement plan is, is to explore your soul purpose. How wonderful. Oneness and, oh, and the soul dominance, they can't work at any mind dominant job that's just about anything. They only can do a job that's part of their soul purpose. I couldn't be, like, I couldn't do a job that wasn't on my soul purpose teaching. I would just wither up. Mm-hmm. Oneness dominant, they, this is your connection to God. It's connection to universe creator, what, however you define that. So it's your connection, but it's also your connection to all people, place, time, where when I went up in my second near death and I felt absolute connection where I was fused with unconditional love, that was an extraordinary oneness moment. So oneness dominant, they value connection and belonging. Sometimes these people don't. Because they're living so much in the spirit dimension, they don't feel connected down here. They feel kind of like a stranger down here on earth. But I would say, how about build connection and belonging as a skill set down here? And I do work with teachers on the loneliness epidemic. And a lot of social media and everything is creating this kind of loneliness epidemic. But that loneliness means your oneness dimension is low. Okay, so I was going to ask you what the difference between spirit and oneness is. And you've touched on it a little bit, but is there any more detail you can give on what separates those two? Sure, I can. Because spirit is, it's, it really is you, looks just like you. And it's come in and it's inside. And, it, and your spirit has so many capabilities. I teach about how your spirit behaves down here on earth. But your spirit's in, it can come out. If it can come out when you die, it can come out while you're alive. And it can travel, it can do all kinds of things. And it'll look just like you. And it can go off and and it can get fragmented and it can be all over the place. Mm, Okay. So sometimes we have that whirling feeling. It's really your spirit. And so you need to learn how to kind of teach your spirit how to be here. And then oneness is your sense of connection and belonging. So your spirit can feel, if you haven't learned how your spirit behaves down here, you can feel really lonely down here. It means your oneness dimension is low. I don't know if that's explaining it perfectly for you. I used to have, when I wrote my first book, like when I first had the vision, I wrote this one. And I called it the exquisiteness of being human because at the time, I was such a stranger here on earth and I always was pining to go home and lonesome for going home. And then in a, in one experience, I thought, you know what? I haven't found the exquisiteness of my life as Margo McKinnon. I have not created the life my spirit came here to live. 
it came down here not to enjoy endure hardship after hardship. It came down here to have some joys after joys. What I have to learn is how to handle these hardships better and transcend them better and go back into joy. So I wrote this one because it was my mission that I was going to find the exquisiteness of my life. So it was a really spirit driven book, but you'll see on my title. Look, I don't know if you can see that, but I have the body, mind, spirit, soul dominance theory. Okay. Because I, at this time in my life, I didn't really understand oneness. But now, ever since I wrote that one, I can now, I've been exploring oneness. I knew what this was. I didn't know a lot about oneness. And I'm learning more and more about oneness. More about how to really connect with that voice, how to really connect with the spiritual dimension, but at the same time, connecting with this physical dimension. I don't know. If, it's so hard to get the words, Melissa, to explain everything because everything just kind of comes in. Yeah. But does that help at all? Does that explain anything? Oh, yeah. Something that comes to mind while you're talking about this is that perhaps different teach. This is why different teachings speak to different people. And the reason I say that is because myself, very clearly, spirit have been spirit dominant for my entire life. And I've had such a hard time grounding into the human experience. Like you were saying, just thinking like, why? Why do I have to eat three meals a day? Why do I have to like do all this stuff? And I have a hard time keeping my house clean and caring about my appearance and all these things because I just, I don't care about that. I care about being out in nature and being peaceful and doing something in the world. And so for someone like me, teachings about transcending the world and experiencing enlightenment might not be the best idea. I need more of embodiment teachings, how to yes. get into your human experience, how to embrace that and really be here and be present with it. Yes, exactly. So we have people who are kind of mind-body people, and they're learning about their spirit side. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of spirit-dominant people who need to learn more about body and mind. Because oftentimes spirit-dominant people, they don't have any money. They don't have, because they don't have that kind of skill set or even desire to go and get, to get a job and make money. And it's so hard for them. So yeah, we, learning how to embodiment like i say in this book cuz i hadn't quite i was still figuring it out back here but i would just eat a lettuce leaf and just say that that's good and then that, that right. was a salad and i would have to say cuz i didn't eat that much and i would say well have you eaten today well i think so well is there any evidence that you've eaten today <laughs> is there a dish that i've eaten or something gone out of your fridge or something because i just really didn't i just lived in this spirit dimension and when I had to do those fasting ceremonies for four days, right on, that means I don't have to cook or do anything for us. So fasting was so easy for me because I was such a spirit dominant person. And so it was easy and I enjoyed, like sometimes we'd have to practice for them. So we'd have to go and sit in a forest for four days all by ourselves. And if you lived, great. And if you didn't, they'd cart you away. But anyway, so... <laughs> I'd be in there going, oh, thank goodness, I can just be here. I don't have to answer a phone, an email, yeah. don't have to cook a meal, nothing. It's great. <laughs> Whereas other people, as soon as the bell goes, oh, your fasting starts now, they're thinking about food already. Right. <laughs> I'm going, yay, I'm off the hook. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's really, and I had some students in my class that I had to teach that because they really weren't enjoying their life enough. And they, there's so much wonderful things about going into the physical dimension, but also the mind dimension too. And the problem with that, we live in a mind dominant world. Mm. School systems are mind dominant. If there's a structure around them that is kind of squeezing us spirit dominance out. And school systems, there are very few spaces in there where a spirit dominant can shine. And so it was my task, I thought, in the classrooms to help the spirit dominance shine in there. Because quite often they were poets and musicians and the really deep, deep thinkers. But on the outside, they looked like ghosts coming into the classroom with their hoodies up and just kind of very ethereal looking. And because they ha had low oneness, 
low connection and belonging. They would go and sit somewhere off to the side. They didn't have the social skills they needed to do well in their life. And they just become progressively more lonely. But they were living in an alternate universe. They were living in the spirit dimension. So quite often they would have like full lives they were living over there. They might have even had different parents and they had friends over there. They had partners over there. They had a career over there. But on the human, they just looked like a shadow sitting in a chair in the classroom. But there was a vibrant world that they were living in that was a spiritual. Some would say their imagination, but to them, it was more real than what's down here. Down here, it was painful. Over there, it's nice. So with those kids, I remember the first one that I tried this out with, and I, he was sitting there under his hoodie, and he'd put his like earbuds in and everything to really push us all away. But anyway, and he, I remember pulling my chair up, and I said, where do you go when you get sick of us? Because I know that spirit dominance gets saturated by the human experience every day and need to go and have a nap or something or just retreat and go away. And I said, where do you go when you get sick of us? And for the first time, there was light in his eyes because his spirit came back in. Mm -hmm. So the light in your eyes tells you how much your spirit's actually in. And he looked at me and said, I build skateboard parks. And so I got him a journal book. I ran across hall. I got him a journal book. And I said, do you ever get formulas? Do you ever have visions about what they need to look like? So, so we started fleshing this all out. And I said, so what's happening to you is you're living over there too much and you're not bringing it into being here. Right. So how about we put you on a schedule where you have to be here on earth for five minutes today, five minutes. Then you get a break and you get to look at your skateboard park in your journal. Where is that? Do five more minutes. Tomorrow, it's going to be 10, 10 minutes. Then the next day, it's going to be 15 that you have. Just like you have to train an athlete. If you want it to just pick up running all of a sudden, you walk one light post, run one light post until you can do a whole mile. Mm -hmm. And so I said to him, no, we've got to keep your spirit down here five minutes at a time until we build your spirit's resiliency for being here. And then I had this other, I was giving a lecture one time, because sometimes, especially with boys, spirit-dominant boys, they can take on a much rougher exterior to push people away. Mm -hmm. Lots of tattoos, piercings, hair, and it's a way of pushing people away. So anyway, I was going to say that in my lecture. And right in the front row was... A guy with all the piercings, the tattoos, the heart. He just looked harsh, the look on his face. But he's at my lecture on spirituality. So I thought, okay, he's opened the door at least. And so I was saying it. I just said, sometimes they have a rougher exterior. And that's to push people away so that they can stay in their spirit dimension where it's peaceful. And sometimes they'll go into drugs and alcohol too. To just get rid of the pain of having to be here. So I was saying that, and at the end of the lecture, he said, you just explained everything about myself. I've done everything. Everything you said about me is exactly what's happening to me. I had to come back and do a lecture to that same organization a year later. And I thought, gee, that guy looks strangely familiar. Turned out it was him. His hair was all back to its natural color. He didn't have the harsh look anymore. He'd actually removed piercings from his face. And he said, you changed my whole life when I realized I'm a spirit dominant person and it's okay for me as a man to have emotions, to be kind, patient. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he had his whole family there at this lecture. And so it was really, really exciting to see. And one time, just last story on that topic, one time I was giving a lecture in Winnipeg and I had all these boxes I was carrying into this thing. I was giving a whole day workshop. And uh, there was a guy out front, it was raining, and there was a guy out front and he had his hoodie on, on, looked harsh, I guess, and he had just lit a cigarette. He was standing out there. <laughs> and I said, okay, listen, could you grab the door for me? Because I'm carrying all these things and I don't want to put it down in the rain. Well, he threw his cigarette down and opened the door. And I said, and to think people, some people think chivalry is dead. I really appreciate that, that you would actually 
throw your cigarette down for me. Mm-hmm. And he was just burst into laughter. <laughs> but how many people would have gone by him and thought, ooh, I better give him a wide berth. I should just stay away from that guy. But really, if we look differently at things and just say some of these behaviors are just to push away because the world is too hard. So to come back around, Melissa, because I know we want to wrap up soon, but to come back around, when that big figure came to me and gave me this, you'll notice I started with the body, the mind, the spirit. The, that large figure that came to me actually started with oneness. It said, we have oneness. We have a soul purpose. We have a spirit. We have a mind to get these things done. We have a body so that we can get these things done. And, but my editor for this book, said, put body first, because Margo, if you start out with oneness, you're going to lose all those mind dominant people going, (laughs) oh, she's woo woo. You're going to lose them. And then they're going to walk out the back door. They're not going to buy your book. And then you're not going to be able to create a more compassionate place for us all to live here on (laughs) earth (laughs) because they're running the world. You need to lead them by the hand and say, you have a body. Oh, yeah. Everybody can agree we have one. Right. You have a mind, a logical, rational self. You have a spirit that came from unconditional love. We'll go back to unconditional love. Some people's spirits are trapped in a mind-dominant job that's crushing their spirit. They get up every day to go to a job they don't want to do. Well, just about every mind-dominant can relate to that. You have a purpose in life. Stay here, everyone. You have a purpose. And you have connection and belonging. How many friends do you have? How many, as a business developer, how many connections are you making? So you have all these five dimensions. He said, my editor said, if you start here, and of course, my question, Melissa, was, yeah, but what if we put oneness first? What if everybody said, woke up every single morning and said, how would the world be different if each one of us put oneness first? In our day, head of the body, ahead of the mind. What if we all tried that, even today? Margo, thank you so much for sharing with us. Just listening to you is just incredible because you've had so many fascinating experiences and you're just a beautiful, beautiful storyteller in the way that you present those experiences. So thank you again for all the work that you're doing. Would you like to share with the viewers where they can get in touch with you, where they can find a copy of your book, and anything else that you have going on? Well, uh, yes, my website is www.drmargomckinnon.com. So it's D-R-M-A-R-G-O-T-M-C-K-I-N-N-O-N.com. I love hearing. If you send me an email, I'll send you one probably right back that day. I love it. I love to hear how your viewers, how their this resonates, questions that they have. I love to answer them. I run meetup groups. I'm actually starting a new meetup group for anybody who wants to write a book and wants to connect with their muse, that voice, but also the practical side of things. Um, and I do webinars as well, because if you understood how your spirit behaves down here on earth, your life will get a whole lot easier. You'll go, oh, is that what it is? Yeah. And it's simple. I'll show you how to kind of discipline your spirit so it's not staying over there in the spirit dimension. You can actually bring your vision down and make it real here. So a book on my website, my meetup groups are there and my webinars or just send me an email. Love it. Wonderful. I will have those links in the description. Thank you so much, Margo. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and comment with your thoughts and opinions and check the description box for the links to my free community where I share lots of resources, my pay what you can community where we do classes and challenges together, my TikTok, Instagram, my clips channel, and lovecoveredlife.com where I share my paintings. Thank you so much for your support.